Section 10 of An Essay on the Development of Christian Doctrine by John Henry Newman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 6 Application of the Seven Notes to the Existing Developments of Christian Doctrine. Application of the First Note of a True Development. Preservation of Type. Part 1. Now let me attempt to apply the foregoing seven notes of fidelity in intellectual developments to the instance of Christian doctrine. And first, as to the note of identity of type. I have said above that whereas all great ideas are found, as time goes on, to involve much which was not seen at first to belong to them, and have developments, that is, enlargements, applications, uses and fortunes very various one security against error and perversion in the process is the maintenance of the original type which the idea presented to the world at its origin amid and through all its apparent changes and vicissitudes from first to last how does this apply to christianity what is its original type and has that type been preserved in the developments commonly called Catholic which have followed, and in the Church which embodies and teaches them? Let us take it as the world now views it in its age, and let us take it as the world once viewed it in its youth, and let us see whether there be any great difference between the early and the later description of it. The following statement will show my meaning there is a religious communion claiming a divine commission and holding all other religious bodies around it heretical or infidel it is a well-organized well-disciplined body it is a sort of secret society binding together its members by influences and by engagements which it is difficult for strangers to ascertain it is spread over the known world it may be weak or insignificant locally but it is strong on the whole from its continuity it may be smaller than all other religious bodies together but is larger than each separately it is a natural enemy to governments external to itself it is intolerant and engrossing and tends to a new modeling of society it breaks laws it divides families it is a gross superstition it is charged with the foulest crimes it is despised by the intellect of the day it is frightful to the imagination of the many and there is but one communion such place this description before pliny or julian place it before frederick the second or guizot apparent dire facies each knows at once without asking a question who is meant by it one object and only one absorbs each item of the detail of the delineation section one the church of the first centuries the prima facie view of early christianity in the eyes of witnesses external to it is presented to us in the brief but vivid descriptions given by tacitus suetonius and pliny the only heathen writers who distinctly mention it for the first hundred and fifty years tacitus is led to speak of the religion on occasion of the conflagration of rome which was popularly imputed to nero Quote, to put an end to the report he says he laid the guilt on others and visited them with the most exquisite punishment those namely who held in abhorrence for their crimes per flagitia in visos were popularly called christians the author of that profession nominis was christ who in the reign of tiberius was capitally punished by the procurator pontius pilate the deadly superstition exitiabilis superstitio though checked for a while broke out afresh and that not only throughout judea the original seat of the evil but through the city also whither all things atrocious or shocking atrocia aut pudenda flow together from every quarter and thrive at first 
certain were seized who avowed it then on their report a vast multitude were convicted not so much of firing the city as of hatred of mankind odio humani generis end quote. after describing their tortures he continues quote, in consequence though they were guilty and deserved most signal punishment they began to be pitied as if destroyed not for any public object but from the barbarity of one man end quote. suetonius relates the same transactions thus quote, capital punishments were inflicted on the christians a class of men of a new and magical superstition superstitionis nove et malefice end quote. what gives additional character to this statement is its context for it occurs as one out of various police or sumptuary or domestic regulations which nero made such as quote, controlling private expenses forbidding taverns to serve meat repressing the contests of theatrical parties and securing the integrity of wills end quote. when pliny was governor of pontus he wrote his celebrated letter to the emperor trajan to ask advice how he was to deal with the christians whom he found there in great numbers one of his points of hesitation was whether the very profession of christianity was not by itself sufficient to justify punishment Quote, whether the name itself should be visited though clear of flagitious acts flagitia, or only when connected with them end quote. He says he had ordered for execution such as persevered in their profession after repeated warnings, quote, as not doubting whatever it was they professed, that at any rate contumacy and inflexible obstinacy ought to be punished. End quote. He required them to invoke the gods, to sacrifice wine and frankincense to the images of the emperor, and to blaspheme Christ. Quote, to which he adds it is said no real christian can be compelled end quote. renegades informed him that quote, the sum total of their offence or fault was meeting before light on an appointed day and saying with one another a form of words caramen, to christ as if to a god and binding themselves by oath not to the commission of any wickedness but against the commission of theft robbery adultery breach of trust denial of deposits that after this they were accustomed to separate and then to meet again for a meal but eaten all together and harmless however that they had even left this off after his edicts enforcing the imperial prohibition of eterie or associations end quote. he proceeded to put two women to the torture but quote, discovered nothing beyond a bad and excessive superstition superstitionem pravam et immodicam the contagion of which he continues had spread through villages and country till the temples were emptied of worshippers two in these testimonies which will form a natural and convenient text for what is to follow we have various characteristics brought before us of the religion to which they relate it was a superstition as all three writers agree a bad and excessive superstition according to pliny a magical superstition according to suetonius a deadly superstition according to tacitus next it was embodied in a society and moreover a secret and unlawful society or eteria and it was a proselytizing society and its very name was connected with flagitious atrocious and shocking acts three now these few points which are not all which might be set down contain in themselves a distinct and significant description of christianity but they have far greater meaning when illustrated by the history of the times the testimony of later writers and the acts of the roman government towards its professors it is impossible to mistake the judgment passed on the religion by these three writers and still more clearly by other writers and imperial functionaries 
they evidently associated Christianity with the Oriental superstitions, whether propagated by individuals or embodied in a rite, which were in that day traversing the empire, and which in the event acted so remarkable a part in breaking up the national forms of worship, and so in preparing the way for Christianity. This, then, is the broad view which the educated heathen took of Christianity. And if it had been very unlike those rites and curious arts in external appearance, they would not have confused it with them. Changes in society are, by a providential appointment, commonly preceded and facilitated by the setting in of a certain current in men's thoughts and feelings in that direction towards which a change is to be made. And as lighter substances whirl about before the tempest and presage it, so words and deeds ominous but not effective of the coming revolution are circulated beforehand through the multitude, or pass across the field of events. This was specially the case with Christianity, as became its high dignity. It came heralded and attended by a crowd of shadows, shadows of itself, impotent and monstrous as shadows are, but not at first sight distinguishable from it by common spectators. Before the mission of the apostles, a movement, of which there had been earlier parallels, had begun in Egypt, Syria, and the neighboring countries, tending to the propagation of new and peculiar forms of worship throughout the empire. Prophecies were afloat that some new order of things was coming in from the east, which increased the existing unsettlement of the popular mind. Pretenders made attempts to satisfy its wants, and old traditions of the truth, embodied for ages in local or in national religions, gave to these attempts a doctrinal and ritual shape, which became an additional point of resemblance to that truth which was soon visibly to appear. 4. The distinctive character of the rites in question lay in their appealing to the gloomy rather than to the cheerful and hopeful feelings, and in their influencing the mind through fear. The notions of guilt and expiation, of evil and good to come, and of dealings with the invisible world, were in some shape or other preeminent in them, and formed a striking contrast to the classical polytheism which was gay and graceful, as was natural in a civilized age. The new rites, on the other hand, were secret. Their doctrine was mysterious. Their profession was a discipline, beginning in a formal initiation, manifested in an association, and exercised in privation and pain. They were, from the nature of the case, proselytizing societies, for they were rising into power nor were they local but vagrant restless intrusive and encroaching their pretensions to supernatural knowledge brought them into easy connection with magic and astrology which are as attractive to the wealthy and luxurious as the more vulgar superstitions to the populace five such were the rites of sibylle isis and mithras such the chaldeans as they were commonly called, and the Magi. They came from one part of the world, and during the first and second century spread with busy perseverance to the northern and western extremities of the empire. Traces of the mysteries of Sibylle, a Syrian deity, if the famous temple at Hierapolis was hers, have been found in Spain, in Gaul, and in Britain, as high up as the wall of Severus. The worship of Isis was the most widely spread of all the pagan deities. It was received in Ethiopia and in Germany, and even the name of Paris has been fancifully traced to it. Both worships, as well as the science of magic, had their colleges of priests and devotees, which were governed by a president, and in some places were supported by farms. Their processions passed from town to town, begging as they went, and attracting proselytes. Apuleius describes one of them as seizing a whip, accusing himself of some offense, and scourging himself in public. These strollers, circulatores, or agirte in classical language, 
told fortunes and distributed prophetical tickets to the ignorant people who consulted them also they were learned in the doctrine of omens of lucky and unlucky days of the rites of expiation and of sacrifices such an agirtes or itinerant was the notorious alexander of abonotaicus till he managed to establish himself in pontus where he carried on so successful an imposition that his fame reached rome and men in office and station entrusted him with their dearest political secrets such a wanderer with a far more religious bearing and a high reputation for virtue was apollonius of tyana who professed the pythagorean philosophy claimed the gift of miracles and roamed about preaching teaching healing and prophesying from india and alexandria to athens and rome another solitary proselytizer though of an earlier time and of an avowed profligacy had been the sacrificulus viewed with such horror by the roman senate as introducing the infamous bacchic rites into rome such again were those degenerate children of a divine religion who in the words of their creator and judge quote, compassed sea and land to make one proselyte and made him twofold more the child of hell than themselves End quote. six these vagrant religionists for the most part professed a severe rule of life and sometimes one of fanatical mortification in the mysteries of mithras the initiation was preceded by fasting and abstinence and a variety of painful trials it was made by means of a baptism as a spiritual washing and it included an offering of bread and some emblem of a resurrection in the samothracian rites it had been a custom to initiate children confession too of greater crimes seems to have been required and would naturally be involved in others in the inquisition prosecuted into the past lives of the candidates for initiation the garments of the converts were white their calling was considered as a warfare militia and was undertaken with a sacramentum or military oath the priests shaved their heads and wore linen and when they were dead were buried in a sacerdotal garment it is scarcely necessary to refer to the mutilation inflicted on the priests of Sibylle. One instance of their scourgings has been already mentioned, and Tertullian speaks of their high priest cutting his arms for the life of the emperor Marcus. The priests of Isis, in lamentation for Osiris, tore their breasts with pine cones. This lamentation was a ritual observance founded on some religious mystery isis lost osiris and the initiated wept in memory of her sorrow the syrian goddess had wept over dead thammuz and her mystics commemorated it by a ceremonial woe in the rites of bacchus an image was laid on a bier at midnight which was bewailed in metrical hymns the god was supposed to die and then to revive nor was this the only worship which was continued through the night while some of the rites were performed in caves seven only a heavenly light can give purity to nocturnal and subterraneous worship caves were at that time appropriated to the worship of the infernal gods it was but natural that these wild religions should be connected with magic and its kindred arts magic has at all times led to cruelty and licentiousness would be the inevitable reaction from a temporary strictness an extraordinary profession when men are in a state of mere nature makes hypocrites or madmen and will in no long time be discarded except by the few the world of that day associated together in one company isiac phrygian mithriac chaldean wizard astrologer fortune teller itinerant and as was not unnatural jew magic was professed by the profligate alexander and was imputed to the grave apollonius the rites of mithras came from the magi of persia and it is obviously difficult to distinguish in principle the ceremonies of the syrian tarobolium 
from those of the Nesiomantia in the Odyssey or of Canidia in Horace. The Theodosian Code calls magic generally a superstition, and magic, orgies, mysteries, and sabbathizings were referred to the same barbarous origin. Magical superstitions, the rites of the Magi, the promises of the Chaldeans, and the Mathematici are familiar to the readers of Tacitus. The Emperor Otho, an avowed patron of Oriental fashions, took part in the rites of Isis and consulted the Mathematici. Vespasian, who also consulted them, is heard of in Egypt as performing miracles at the suggestion of Serapis. Tiberius, in an edict, classes together Egyptian and Jewish rites, and Tacitus and Suetonius, in recording it, speak of the two religions together as ea superstitio. Augustus had already associated them together as superstitions and as unlawful, and that in contrast to others of a like foreign origin. Quote, as to foreign rites, peregrine ceremonie, says Suetonius, as he paid more reverence to those which were old and enjoined, so did he hold the rest in contempt. End quote. He goes on to say that even on the judgment seat he had recognized the Eleusinian priests into whose mysteries he had been initiated at Athens, quote, whereas when traveling in Egypt he had refused to see Apis and had approved of his grandson Caligula's passing by Judea without sacrificing at Jerusalem. End quote. Plutarch speaks of magic as connected with the mournful mysteries of Orpheus and Zoroaster, with the Egyptian and the Phrygian, and in his treatise on superstition he puts together in one clause as specimens of that disease of mind, covering oneself with mud, wallowing in the mire, sabbathizings, fallings on the face, unseemly postures, foreign adorations. Ovid mentions in consecutive verses the rites of Adonis lamented by Venus, the Sabbath of the Syrian Jew, and the Memphitic temple of Io in her linen dress. Juvenal speaks of the rites, as well as the language and the music, of the Syrian Orontes having flooded Rome, and in his description of the superstition of the Roman women, he places the low Jewish fortune-teller between the pompous priests of Sibylle and Isis, and the bloody witchcraft of the Armenian Haraspex and the astrology of the Chaldeans. 8. The Christian, being at first accounted a kind of Jew, was even on that score included in whatever odium and whatever bad associations attended on the Jewish name. But in a little time his independence of the rejected people was clearly understood, as even the persecutions show, and he stood upon his own ground. Still, his character did not change in the eyes of the world. For favor or for reproach, he was still associated with the votaries of secret and magical rites. The Emperor Hadrian, noted as he is for his inquisitive temper and a partaker in so many mysteries, still believed that the Christians of Egypt allowed themselves in the worship of Serapis. They are brought into connection with the magic of Egypt in the history of what is commonly called the Thundering Legion, so far as this, that the rain which relieved the emperor's army in the field, and which the church ascribed to the prayers of the Christian soldiers, is by Dio Cassius attributed to an Egyptian magician who obtained it by invoking mercury and other spirits. This war had been the occasion of one of the first recognitions which the state had conceded to the Oriental rites, though statesmen and emperors, as private men, had long taken part in them. The emperor Marcus had been urged by his fears of the Marcomanni to resort to those foreign introductions, and is said to have employed Magi and Chaldeans in averting an unsuccessful issue of the war. It is observable that in the growing countenance which was extended to these rites in the third century, Christianity came in for a share. The chapel of Alexander Severus contained statues of Abraham, Orpheus, Apollonius, Pythagoras, 
and our lord here indeed as in the case of zenobia's judaism an eclectic philosophy aided the comprehension of religions but immediately before alexander heliogabalus who was no philosopher while he formally seated his syrian idol in the palatine while he observed the mysteries of sibylle and adonis and celebrated his magic rites with human victims intended also according to lampridius to unite with his horrible superstition quote, the jewish and samaritan religions and the christian rite so that the priesthood of heliogabalus might comprise the mystery of every worship end quote. hence more or less the stories which occur in ecclesiastical history of the conversion or goodwill of the emperors to the christian faith of hadrian mamea and others besides heliogabalus and alexander such stories might often mean little more than that they favored it among other forms of oriental superstition nine what has been said is sufficient to bring before the mind an historical fact which indeed does not need evidence upon the established religions of europe the east had renewed her encroachments and was pouring forth a family of rites which in various ways attracted the attention of the luxurious the political the ignorant the restless and the remorseful armenian chaldee egyptian jew syrian phrygian as the case might be was the designation of the new hierophant and magic superstition barbarism jugglery were the names given to his right by the world in this company appeared christianity when then three well-informed writers call christianity a superstition and a magical superstition they were not using words at random or the language of abuse but they were describing it in distinct and recognized terms as cognate to those gloomy secret odious disreputable religions which were making so much disturbance up and down the empire Ten, the impression made on the world by circumstances immediately before the rise of christianity received a sort of confirmation upon its rise in the appearance of the gnostic and kindred heresies which issued from the church during the second and third centuries their resemblance in ritual and constitution to the oriental religions sometimes their historical relationship is undeniable and certainly it is a singular coincidence that christianity should be first called a magical superstition by suetonius and then should be found in the intimate company and seemingly the parent of a multitude of magical superstitions if there was nothing in the religion itself to give rise to such a charge eleven the gnostic family suitably traces its origin to a mixed race which had commenced its national history by associating orientalism with revelation after the captivity of the ten tribes samaria was colonized by quote, men from babylon and cushan and from Ava and from hamath and from sepharvaim end quote, who were instructed at their own instance in quote, the manner of the god of the land end quote, by one of the priests of the church of jeroboam the consequence was that quote, they feared the lord and served their own gods end quote. of this country was simon the reputed patriarch of the gnostics and he is introduced in the acts of the apostles as professing those magical powers which were so principal a characteristic of the oriental mysteries his heresy though broken into a multitude of sects was poured over the world with a catholicity not inferior in its day to that of christianity st peter who fell in with him originally in samaria seems to have encountered him again at rome at rome st polycarp met marcion of pontus whose followers spread through italy egypt syria arabia and persia valentinus preached his doctrines in alexandria rome and cyprus and we read of his disciples in crete caesarea antioch and other parts of the east bardesanes and his followers were found in mesopotamia 
the carpocratians are spoken of at alexandria at rome and in cephalenia the basilidians spread through the greater part of egypt the ophites were apparently in bithynia and galatia the canites or caeans in africa and the marcosians in gaul to these must be added several sects which though not strictly of the gnostic stock are associated with them in date character and origin the ebionites of palestine the serinthians who rose in some part of asia minor the encratites and kindred sects who spread from mesopotamia to syria to cilicia and other provinces of asia minor and thence to rome gaul aquitaine and spain and the montanists who with a town in phrygia for their metropolis reached at length from constantinople to carthage Quote, when the reader of christian history comes to the second century says dr burton he finds that gnosticism under some form or other was professed in every part of the then civilized world he finds it divided into schools as numerously and as zealously attended as any which greece or asia could boast in their happiest days he meets with names totally unknown to him before which excited as much sensation as those of aristotle or plato he hears of volumes having been written in support of this new philosophy not one of which has survived to our own day End quote. many of the founders of these sects had been christians others were of jewish parentage others were more or less connected in fact with the pagan rites to which their own bore so great a resemblance montanus seems even to have been a mutilated priest of sibylle the followers of prodicus professed to possess the secret books of zoroaster and the doctrine of dualism which so many of the sects held is to be traced to the same source basilides seems to have recognized mithras as the supreme being or the prince of angels or the sun if mithras is equivalent to abraxas which was inscribed upon his amulets on the other hand he is said to have been taught by an immediate disciple of saint peter and valentinus by an immediate disciple of saint paul marcion was the son of a bishop of pontus tatian a disciple of saint justin martyr twelve whatever might be the history of these sects and though it may be a question whether they can be properly called superstitions and though many of them numbered educated men among their teachers and followers they closely resembled at least in ritual and profession the vagrant pagan mysteries which have been above described their very name of gnostic implied the possession of a secret which was to be communicated to their disciples ceremonial observances were the preparation and symbolical rites the instrument of initiation tatian and montanus the representatives of very distinct schools agreed in making asceticism a rule of life the followers of each of these sectaries abstained from wine the tatianites and marcionites from flesh the montanists kept three lengths in the year all the gnostic sects seem to have condemned marriage on one or other reason the marcionites had three baptisms or more the marcosians had two rites of what they called redemption the latter of these was celebrated as a marriage and the room adorned as a marriage chamber a consecration to a priesthood then followed with anointing an extreme unction was another of their rites and prayers for the dead one of their observances bardesanes and harmonius were famous for the beauty of their chants the prophecies of montanus were delivered like the oracles of the heathen in a state of enthusiasm or ecstasy to epiphanes the son of carpocrates who died at the age of seventeen a temple was erected in the island of cephalenia his mother's birthplace where he was celebrated with hymns and sacrifices a similar honor was paid by the carpocratians to homer pythagoras plato aristotle as well as to the apostles crowns were placed upon their images and incense burned before them in one of the inscriptions found at cyrene 
after twenty years since zoroaster pythagoras epicurus and others are put together with our lord as guides of conduct these inscriptions also contain the carpocration tenet of a community of women i am unwilling to allude to the agape and communions of certain of these sects which were not surpassed in profligacy by the pagan rites of which they were an imitation the very name of gnostic became an expression for the worst impurities and no one dared eat bread with them or use their culinary instruments or plates thirteen these profligate excesses are found in connection with the exercise of magic and astrology the amulets of the basilidians are still extant in great numbers inscribed with symbols some christian some with figures of isis serapis and anubis represented according to the gross indecencies of the egyptian mythology st irenaeus had already connected together the two crimes in speaking of the simonians Quote, their mystical priests he says live in lewdness and practice magic according to the ability of each they use exorcisms and incantations love potions too and seductive spells the virtue of spirits and dreams and all other curious arts they diligently observe end quote. the marcosians were especially devoted to these curious arts which are also ascribed to carpocrates and apelles marcion and others are reported to have used astrology tertullian speaks generally of the sects of his day quote, infamous are the dealings of the heretics with sorcerers very many with mountebanks with astrologers with philosophers to wit such as are given to curious questions they everywhere remember seek and ye shall find End quote. such were the gnostics and to external and prejudiced spectators whether philosophers as celsus and porphyry or the multitude they wore an appearance sufficiently like the church to be mistaken for her in the latter part of the antinicene period as she was confused with the pagan mysteries in the earlier fourteen of course it may happen that the common estimate concerning a person or a body is purely accidental and unfounded but in such cases it is not lasting such were the calumnies of child-eating and impurity in the christian meetings which were almost extinct by the time of origin and which might arise from the world's confusing them with the pagan and heretical rites but when it continues from age to age it is certainly an index of a fact and corresponds to definite qualities in the object to which it relates in that case even mistakes carry information for they are cognate to the truth and we can allow for them often what seems like a mistake is merely the mode in which the informant conveys his testimony or the impression which a fact makes on him censure is the natural tone of one man in a case where praise is the natural tone of another the very same character or action inspires one mind with enthusiasm and another with contempt what to one man is magnanimity to another is romance and pride to a third and pretense to a fourth while to a fifth it is simply unintelligible and yet there is a certain analogy in their separate testimonies which conveys to us what the thing is like and what it is not like when a man's acknowledged note is superstition we may be pretty sure we shall not find him an academic or an epicurean and even words which are ambiguous as atheist or reformer admit of a sure interpretation when we are informed of the speaker in like manner there is a certain general correspondence between magic and miracle obstinacy and faith insubordination and zeal for religion sophistry and argumentative talent craft and meekness as is obvious let us proceed then in our contemplation of this reflection as it may be called of primitive christianity in the mirror of the world fifteen all three writers tacitus suetonius and pliny 
call it a superstition this is no accidental imputation but is repeated by a variety of subsequent writers and speakers the charge of thyestian banquets scarcely lasts a hundred years but while pagan witnesses are to be found the church is accused of superstition the heathen disputant in minutius calls christianity vana et demens superstitio the lawyer modestinus speaks with an apparent allusion to christianity of quote, weak minds being terrified superstitione numinis end quote. the heathen magistrate asks saint marcellus whether he and others have put away quote, vain superstitions end quote, and worship the gods whom the emperors worship the pagans in arnobius speak of christianity as quote, an execrable and unlucky religion full of impiety and sacrilege contaminating the rites instituted from of old with the superstition of its novelty end quote. the anonymous opponent of lactantius calls it impia et anilis superstitio diocletian's inscription at clunia was as it declared on occasion of quote, the total extinction of the superstition of the christians and the extension of the worship of the gods end quote. maximin in his letter upon constantine's edict still calls it a superstition sixteen now what is meant by the word thus attached by a consensus of heathen authorities to christianity at least it cannot mean a religion in which a man might think what he pleased and was set free from all yokes whether of ignorance fear authority or priestcraft when heathen writers call the oriental rites superstitions they evidently use the word in its modern sense it cannot surely be doubted that they apply it in the same sense to christianity but plutarch explains for us the word at length in his treatise which bears the name Quote, of all kinds of fear he says superstition is the most fatal to action and resource he does not fear the sea who does not sail nor war who does not serve nor robbers who keeps at home nor the sycophant who is poor nor the envious if he is a private man nor an earthquake if he lives in gaul nor thunder if he lives in ethiopia but he who fears the gods fears everything earth seas air sky darkness light noises silence sleep slaves sleep and forget their masters of the fettered doth sleep lighten the chain inflamed wounds ulcers cruel and agonizing are not felt by the sleeping superstition alone has come to no terms with sleep but in the very sleep of her victims as though they were in the realms of the impious she raises horrible spectres and monstrous phantoms and various pains and whirls the miserable soul about and persecutes it they rise and instead of making light of what is unreal they fall into the hands of quacks and conjurers who say call the crone to expiate bathe in the sea and sit all day on the ground End quote he goes on to speak of the introduction of quote, uncouth names and barbarous terms into the divine and national authority of religion end quote. observes that whereas slaves when they despair of freedom may demand to be sold to another master superstition admits of no change of gods since quote, the god cannot be found whom he will not fear who fears the gods of his family and his birth who shudders at the saving and the benignant who has a trembling and dread at those from whom we ask riches and wealth concord peace success of all good words and deeds end quote. he says moreover that while death is to all men an end of life it is not so to the superstitious for then quote, there are deep gates of hell to yawn and headlong streams of at once fire and gloom are opened and darkness with its many phantoms encompasses 
ghosts presenting horrid visages and wretched voices and judges and executioners and chasms and dens full of innumerable miseries end quote. presently he says that in misfortune or sickness the superstitious man refuses to see physician or philosopher and cries suffer me o man to undergo punishment the impious the cursed the hated of gods and spirits the atheist with whom all along he is contrasting the superstitious disadvantageously quote, wipes his tears trims his hair doffs his mourning but how can you address how help the superstitious he sits apart in sackcloth or filthy rags and often he strips himself and rolls in the mud and tells out his sins and offences as having eaten and drunken something or walked some way which the divinity did not allow and in his best mood and under the influence of a good-humoured superstition he sits at home with sacrifice and slaughter all round him while the old crones hang on him as on a peg as byron says any charm they fall in with he continues what men like best are festivals banquets at the temples initiations orgies votive prayers and adorations but the superstitious wishes indeed but is unable to rejoice he is crowned and turns pale he sacrifices and is in fear he prays with a quivering voice and burns incense with trembling hands and altogether belies the saying of pythagoras that we are then in best case when we go to the gods for superstitious men are in most wretched and evil case approaching the houses or shrines of the gods as if they were the dens of bears or the holes of snakes or the caves of whales End quote. 17 here we have a vivid picture of plutarch's idea of the essence of superstition it was the imagination of the existence of an unseen ever-present master the bondage of a rule of life of a continual responsibility obligation to attend to little things the impossibility of escaping from duty the inability to choose or change one's religion an interference with the enjoyment of life a melancholy view of the world sense of sin horror at guilt apprehension of punishment dread self-abasement depression anxiety and endeavor to be at peace with heaven and error and absurdity in the methods chosen for the purpose such too had been the idea of the epicurean velaeus when he shrunk with horror from the sempiternus dominus and curiosus deus of the stoics such surely was the meaning of tacitus suetonius and pliny and hence of course the frequent reproach cast on christians as credulous weak-minded and poor-spirited the heathen objectors in minutius and lactantius speak of their old woman's tales celsus accuses them of quote, assenting at random and without reason saying do not inquire but believe they lay it down he says elsewhere let no educated man approach no man of wisdom no man of sense but if a man be unlearned weak in intellect an infant let him come with confidence confessing that these are worthy of their god they evidently desire as they are able to convert none but fools and vulgar and stupid and slavish women and boys they take in the simple and lead him where they will they address themselves to youths house servants and the weak in intellect they hurry away from the educated as not fit subjects of their imposition and inveigle the rustic End quote. Quote, thou says the heathen magistrate to the martyr fructuosus who as a teacher dost disseminate a new fable that fickle girls may desert the groves and abandon jupiter condemn if thou art wise the anile creed End quote. End of section 10.